All right, I am recording it so that I can post it later. All right, so uh, again, to check to see if the observed data that you have fits what you would have expected it to be, because you can calculate the probability, the theoretical probability, but does the data that you get fit that expected value? So that's the first way that we use the chi-squared. And that's what we're going to look at in this example. So one study indicates that the number of televisions that American families have is distribu distributed. This is the given distribution for the American population. So this table represents what they expect the percentage of television ownership to be. So no televisions in the household, they expect 10% of the population to have no televisions. They expect 16% to have one television, 55% have two, et cetera. So this is what they expect. So historically or whatever, they've determined that this is the, number, the percentages that they would expect to see. So then they conduct a test and get a sample. If PowerPoint went back, back, back. All right, so they took a sample of 600 families. And what they found is that the percentages look like this. So 66, that's not a percent, that's a typo. This is because I cut and pasted. This is the number. So the number of families in this six sample of 600 that didn't own any televisions were 66. The number of families who owned one television was 119. The number of families that owned two televisions was 340, et cetera. So this table contains the observed frequency values. So we have what we would expect from the previous table and what we observed from this table. At a 1% significance level, does it appear that the distribution number of televisions of far Western United States families is different from the distribution of the American population as a whole? So this is the observed values of the far Western United States. Is it different than what we would expect to find for the population as a whole? So we're going to use the chi-squared test to determine is this significantly different than what we would expect to see? All right, so our two tables are here and this is not a percent, that's a, again, that's me copy and pasting. This is the number. Okay, so we have observed here and expected here. And the expected is what we see based on the population of the United States. And the observed is what we saw in the far Western United States um, of America. So as you can see, our two tables are different in what they're displaying. The expected values are in a percent and the observed values are in the number of families out of a sample of 600. So the observed values are frequencies and the expected values are percentages. And to be able to use the chi-squared test, they both have to be in the same units. So what we would have to do is convert the percentages to frequencies. So we would actually take 10% of 600 to get what we would expect to see as the number of families from the six, sample of 600. 
So we would have to take 10% of the 600 to get the uh, expected frequency of families. They have to be in the same units. Now we can actually let our calculators calculate this for us. So the expected value, we would expect 10% of 600 or 60, 16% of 600 or whatever that number is, and 55% of 600 for two televisions, 11% of um, 600 to be three televisions and 8% of 600 to be four or more televisions. And we can actually let our calculators calculate this for us because to be able to conduct the chi-squared test, we need to put our observed values and our expected values in a list. So to be able to conduct the chi-squared test, we need to put observed values in one list and expected values in another list, and then we just conduct the test. It's really simple to do. So I'm going to put my observed values in my first list, and I'm going to put my exact expected values in list two. And I'm going to let my calculator actually calculate those percentages for me. All right, so I'm going to go open my calculator and I'm gonna put this information in. Okay, so I'm going to go to my stat menu and I'm going to edit. And this morning I went ahead and put my observed values in my first list. So you can see in the L1 list are those observed values of the number of TVs in the Western, far Western United States. Okay, so now I'm going to put uh, in L2 what I, wait, did I say? Those are, L1 is observed, L2 is expected. So I'm gonna put in L2 what I would have expected based on the percentages of the population of the United States. So the first percentage was we would expect 10% of the 600 to own no televisions at all. So I'm just gonna type that in 10% of 600. So 0.1 times 600. And so I can do this in the list or I can do this outside the list and then input it. Okay, 60. All right, the next one was 16% of 600. So I'm gonna do 0 0.16 times 600, which is 96. So we would have expected out of this 600 people that 96 would own one television. All right, so what was the next percentage, 55? Times 600. All right, and then what do we have? 11%. It's like watching paint dry, watching me input stuff in the calculator. And then 8%. Boy, howdy, have you gotten your money's worth out of this calculator? Because in the next test, we're gonna use matrices. You've got your money's worth. Was that times 600? All right. So now I have in my L1 what I observed 66, 119, 340, 60, 15. And in L2, I have what I would have expected 60% of 600. So I would expect 60 to have televisions, zero, no televisions, 16% uh, of 600 or 96, 55% of 600, 330, 11% uh, of 600 or 66, and 8% of 600 or 48. So now I'm gonna exit out of this menu. So do a second quit. And now I'm going to go back in to my stat menu. 
and I'm going to go over to tests. And I'm going to find my chi-squared test. Goodness of fit. So number D, my chi-squared goodness of fit test, because that's what I'm testing. Does the observed values differ significantly from what I would expect to see. So I'm going to hit enter. And again, it's going to ask me where my observed values are. And I put my observed values in the list one. I put the expected values in list two. And I need to tell my calculator the number of degrees of freedom. Now I had in this data four categories. And the four categories were, excuse me, I can count, five categories. So the five categories were no televisions, one television, two televisions, three televisions, or four or more televisions. So there were five categories. So the degrees of freedom is the number of categories minus one. So five minus one, so it is four. So we're gonna go down here and hit calculate. And here we go. So our uh, chi-squared, our uh, test statistic is 29.6. By the way, I never wrote the null hypothesis, which I need to go do. Um, degrees of free, our p-value is very, very, very small. It's 5.776 times 10 to the minus six. So it's 0 0.000006, very small. Degrees of freedom is four. So let me go back to my PowerPoint. And let me write my null and alternative hypothesis. So my null hypothesis would be that the number of TVs in the Western, far Western United States is not different, it's the same as. The pop US population. And the alter alternative hypothesis would be that it's not the same. Or the distribution is not the same. Okay, and then I conducted my test. I got my test value, my chi-squared value, and I got my p-value. And based on my p-value, I'm going to reject or not reject this null hypothesis. So on the next slide, we got a p-value of 0 0.000006 from the test. The chi-squared, test value was 29.6. The p-value, of course, is the area under the curve to the right of that chi-squared test statistic. And the p-value is very low. If the p-value is low, then you're going to reject the null hypothesis. This p-value is significantly different from our alpha. It's much, much lower. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis. So since our p-value is below our level of significance, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. So we reject the belief that the distribution for the far Western United States is the same as the American population as a whole. So the conclusion is at a 1% significance level, 
From the data that we observed, there's sufficient evidence to conclude that the number of televisions distribution for the far Western United States is different than the number of television distribution for the American population as a whole. They are significantly different. The observed data doesn't fit what we would have expected to see if the distribution was the same as the United States population as a whole. So that's what the goodness of fit chi-square distribution test. Is it, does it fit what we would expect to see or is it significantly different than what we would expect to see? So we reject the null. I want to make sure we see that. All right. All right, let's do one last goodness of fit example, and then we'll move to um, independence. Suppose you flip two coins 100 times. The results are 20 where you get both heads, 27 where you get a head tail, 30 where you get tail head, and 23 are tail tail. Are the coins fair? Test at a 5% significance level. Okay, so the observed data is the data that you got from conducting your test. So what you observe is that there are 20 where you get both heads, 27 where you get a head tail, 30 where you get a tail head, and 23 where you get tail tail. Okay, what would you expect to see? So you have to go back to your probability. How do you calculate probability? Mm, been a while. All right. So what would you expect? I can't spell observed, apparently. Yeah, I'm a math teacher. I don't have to be able to spell. Okay, well, so what would you expect? What's the probability if you flip two coins, you get a head, and you get a head? Well, these are independent trials. One coin doesn't affect the outcome of the second coin. So flipping two coins are completely independent. So the probability of getting a head and a head, if these are independent trials, is a product of the two individual probabilities. So you multiply the two probabilities together. So what's the probability if you flip a coin, you get a head? Well, there's a head and a tail, so the probability would be one half. Well, for the second coin, the probability of getting a head is again a half. So the probability of getting two heads is one fourth. The probability of getting a head and a tail would again be one half times one half, which is a fourth. The probability of getting a tail head would be one half times one half, which is one fourth. And the probability of getting two tails, again, would be one half times one half, which is one fourth. So the probability of me getting a head head being a fourth. So what I would expect if I flip a coin a hundred times, I would expect to get a head head 25 times out of the 100. One fourth of those would be head head, all right? 
I would expect to also get 25 head tails. And 25 tail heads and 25 tail tails. So that's what I would expect to see if I were, if this were theoretic, if the probability was theoretical, that's what I would expect to see. 25 head heads, 25 head tails, 25 tail heads, and 25 tail tails. Okay, so the number of degrees of freedom, since I have Let me write my hypothesis first. So my null hypothesis would be, um, and my alternate hypothesis would be, well, I'm looking to see if these coins are fair. So my null hypothesis is going to be that the coins are fair. And my alter alternative hypothesis is going to be that they aren't. All right. And I'm going to determine whether I want to reject or ex, uh, not reject my null hypothesis. So I need to put this information in my calculator and conduct a test, okay? So I am going to look at what's the expected and observed number of heads I would see. Okay, so if I flip two coins, I could get no heads. That would be the case where I get two tails. And the probability of me getting two tails was one fourth. So I would expect to get 25 flips, 25 out of my 100 to be no heads. Now I could also get one head. This is the case where I get head tails or tail heads. So the probability of me getting head tails was a fourth. The probability of me getting tail heads was also a fourth. So the probability of me getting one head is one fourth plus one fourth or a half. So 50 out of these flips, I would expect to get one head. The next category I have, and I could have done this with tails too, it'd be the same thing. But the next category would be that I get two heads. So what's the probability of me flipping a coin and getting two heads? Well, that was one fourth. Head head would be one fourth. So I would expect, 25 out of these 100 flips to be head head. So this is what I expect to see out of this 100 flips. I would expect to see 25 flips that I get no heads. 50 of the flips I would get two heads, excuse me, one head. And 25 flips I would get 25 heads. Now what I observed was that getting no heads, there were 23 flips where I got tail tail. So that is what I observed from my experiment. Also from my experiment, there were 57 flips where I only got one head. I had 27 where I had head tail and 30 where I had tail head. So the total number of flips where I got one head was 57. And then there were 20 flips where I got both coins to be heads. So that's what I observed from my experiment. So what I observed is in that last column, what I would expect theoretically is in the third column. And now I'm going to conduct the test based on this data. Now the number of degrees of freedom 
is the number of categories I have, which is three minus one, which is two. So the number of degrees of freedom in my chi-squared test is the number of categories that I have minus one. So since I'm looking at the number of heads I get in the flips of 100 coins, or 100 flips of two coins is the correct way to put it, then I have three categories. I could get no heads, one head, two heads. So my degrees of freedom is two. Okay, so now let's go to our calculators. All right, so I'm going to go to my statistics menu and edit. And I'm going to put my data in my L1 and L2. So I'm going to clear it out. OK, so my expected values, or excuse me, my observed values for the number of heads I had were 23. Um, 57 and 20. All right now we're going to go and we're going to put our expected values in. All right, I would expect to get no heads 25 times. I would expect to get one head 50 times. I would expect to get um, two heads 25 times. All right, so I have my data in my calculator. Now I can go conduct the test. Go to my stat menu, tests, find my chi-squared goodness of fit test. And the only thing I'm going to have to change here, I did put my observed values in L1 and my expected values in L2, but I do need to change the number of degrees of freedom. I use three categories, three minus one is two, and now calculate. All right. So my chi-squared statistic is, did I get this in here correctly? Something looks weird. Make sure I inputted everything correctly. All right. Talk amongst yourselves. All right. Okay, so my p value in this case is 0.34. So if my p is high, the null must fly. So I'm not going to reject the null hypothesis. So it does appear that the coins are fair because the uh, data does fit what I would have expected the theoretical probability to be. So since the theoretical probability was that I should have gotten um, no heads 25 times and one head 50 times and uh, two heads 25 times, my data does, accord, uh, uh, based on this test, fit that. So based on my observed data, I can't reject the null hypothesis. So since alpha is less than the p-value, my p-value was what? Was it 0.34? Oh, well, that's interesting. What did I get, 0.34? Is that what I got? Since my p-value is greater than my alpha, if the p is high, the null must fly, I can't reject the null hypothesis. 
And since I can't reject the null hypothesis, I can't accept the alternative that the coins are not fair. So there's insufficient evidence for me to conclude that the coins are not fair. They appear to be fair. All right. Independence. We're going to use matrices. Tests of independence involve using contingency tables of observed data values. So contingency tables are just that. It's, it's been a while since we looked at contingency tables. Gosh, what chapter was that in? But this is going to be, we had an, a problem in your uh, homework way back when where you looked at um, the number of tickets and I don't remember what it was, but you're gonna have rows of information versus columns of information. So that's what a contingency table was. So you can look at what's the probability of this and this occurring. So whatever the row information is and whatever the column information is based on the value in that row and that column. That's why we're using matrices because we're gonna have rows and we're gonna have columns of data. The test statistic for a test of independence is similar to that of the goodness of fit test, where um, you're going to sum up these differences between the observed and expected values, and you're going to divide that by the expected value. But this case, since it's a contingency table, you're going to have rows and columns of information. So the test of independence determines whether these two factors are independent or not. And the number of degrees of freedom for a test of independence is the number of rows you have in your contingencies table minus one times the number of columns you have in your contingency table minus one. So to find the degrees of freedom, you're gonna multiply the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. Okay, independence. It's been a while since we talked about independence. We did just talk about a coin flip. If we flip two coins, that those two coins flip are going to be independent of each other. One coin outcome is not affected one iota by the other coin's outcome. So two events are independent if the following are true the probability of A occurring given, given B has already occurred is just the probability of A. The probability of B occurring given that A has already occurred is just the probability of B. And the probability of both of them occurring is the product of those two probabilities, just like our flipping of the coin in the last example. The probability of getting a head head, since those are independent events, is the probability of getting ahead times the probability of getting ahead. So the first coin is ahead and the second coin is ahead is the product of those two probabilities. The two events A and B are independent if the knowledge that one occurred does not affect the chance the other occurs. For example, the outcomes of two rolls of fair die are independent events. So if I take a fair die and I roll it, Whatever outcome I get, I pick up that die and I roll it again. The second outcome is no way affected by whatever the first outcome was. They're independent events. The outcome of the first roll does not change the probability for the outcome of the second roll. Note, the expected value for each cell needs to be at least five in order for you to use this test. So if any expected value in any cell is less than five, you cannot use the chi-squared test. Okay, so this is the example we're going to do. Well, actually we're gonna look at this first and then we'll look at an example. This is just to show you how to calculate the expected value. Suppose A is a speeding violation in the last year 
So event A is that you get a speed, you get a speeding ticket in the last year. And event B is that you're using a cell phone while driving. If A and B are independent, then P of A and B, that you get a speeding ticket and you were using a cell phone, is the probability of getting a speeding ticket times the probability you were using a cell phone. A and B is the event that a driver received a speeding ticket last year and was also using a cell phone while driving. Suppose in a study of drivers who received speeding violations in the last year and who used cell phones while driving that 755 people were surveyed. So they, that's the sample size. Out of the 755, 70 had a speeding violation and 685 did not. 305 used cell phones while driving and 450 did not, okay? So let Y be the expected number of drivers who used a cell phone while driving and received speeding violations. I paused because it told me my um, internet connection was uh, slow. Can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. All right. So if A and B are independent, then P, the probability of A and B occurring is the probability of A occurring times the probability of B occurring. If two events are independent, the probability of both of them occurring is just the product of the two probabilities. So the expected number of drivers who used a cell phone while driving and received speeding tickets is the probability of that happening is Y over 755. If we surveyed 755, people and why is the number of people who got a ticket while using a cell phone, then the probability of that would be y over 755. But out of those 755, we had 70 got a speeding violation. So the number of people who got a speeding violation is the 70 over 755. The number of people who were using a cell phone out of those surveyed was 30. So the probability you used a cell phone is 30 out of 755. So this is a probability equation. So this represents the probability that you used a cell phone and got a ticket. And if the events are independent, then that's going to be the product of the probability that we used a cell phone. That's a ticket, isn't it? Ticket times the probability that we used a cell phone. So I can solve for y. So y would be 770 times 30 divided by 755 or 28.3. So about 28 people from this sample are expected to use cell phones while driving and receiving speeding violations. So about 28 people were using cell phones and got a speeding ticket, okay? So that's how you find the expected value from your information, all right? So let's look at this example again. So in the test of independence, we state the null and alternative hypothesis in words since the contingency table consists of two factors, 
the null hypothesis states that these factors are independent. And the alternative hypothesis states that they're not, that they're dependent. So for this example, our null hypothesis would be that using a cell phone while driving and getting a speeding violation are not related to each other. They're independent events. So being a cell phone user while driving and receiving a speeding violation are completely independent of each other. The alternative hypothesis would be that they're not independent of each other. So you would say being a cell phone user while driving and receiving a speeding ticket is are dependent events. If the null hypothesis is true, we would expect about 28 people to use cell phones while driving and receive a speeding violation. That would, would be what we would expect to see. Come on, PowerPoint, cooperate. It's not cooperating. All right, so let's now apply this to an actual example. If PowerPoint will catch up here. All right. So in this example, we have volunteers. In a volunteer group, adults 21 and older volunteer from one to nine hours each week to spend time with a disabled senior citizen. The program recruits among community college students, four-year college students, and non-students. In this table below, there's a sample of the adult volunteers and the number of hours they volunteer a week. So this is what we observe. So we observe that from the community college students, 111 from the 839 students that we have, or excuse me, volunteers. So the total number of volunteers is 839. So 111 of these total number of volunteers volunteer from the community college students for one to three hours. For the community college students, four to six hours, 96 of the 839 volunteer. For seven to nine hours, 48 of the community college students volunteer from seven to nine hours. So in total, 255 of the 839 students are volunteers from the community college. The next row down is the number of four-year college students. So 96 of four-year college students volunteer from one to three hours. 133 volunteer from four to six hours. 61 volunteer from seven to nine hours. So in total, of the 839 volunteers, 290 of them are four-year college students. Non-students, 91 volunteer from one to three hours, 150 from four to six, 53 from seven to nine. So the total number of non-students who volunteer are 294. So 294 out of the 839 volunteers are non-students. So that's the rows. So the rows tell us from each category the number uh, that volunteer that number of hours. Now the columns tell us the total number of volunteers that volunteer that many hours. So one to three hours, the total number of volunteers that volunteer one to three hours is 298. So 298 out of the 839 volunteer for uh, one to three hours. 379 from the 839 volunteer from four to six hours and 162 out of the 839 volunteer from seven to nine hours. So this is our observed data. How in the world do we calculate what we would expect to see? 
So how you calculate the expected value is you take the row total, you multiply it by the column total, and you divide that by the total number in the survey. So this is what we're going to do. Our null hypothesis is going to be that the number of hours volunteered is completely independent of the type of volunteer you get. So the number of hours volunteered is completely independent as, from the type of volunteer you have. Our alternative hypothesis is going to be that the number of hours does depend on where we get the volunteer. So if they're a college student or not, is different than if they're non-college students. So it's not independent. The number of hours that they volunteer is not independent of what kind of volunteer they are. Okay, let me put my coffee down. <clears throat> All right, so I need to create a table of expected values, because I have the observed, that's given to me. So I have my type of volunteer. Which we had community college students. Four year college students. And non students. Okay, and then we had one to three hours. Four to six hours. And seven to nine hours. All right, to find the values in each cell of this table, I am going to use the expected value formula, which says that I would expect it to follow the row total times the column total divided by the total number surveyed. So for example, to find the expected value of the number of community college students who volunteered one to three hours, what I would expect to see, not what I actually observed, what I would expect to see is I take the row total, whatever that is, I multiply it by the column total for one to three hours, and I divide it by the total number that I surveyed, which was 839. So to find the expected value in that first row, first column, which I'm gonna denote as E11. So the number of community college students who volunteered one to three hours, I'm going to take the row total, which looking at my observed values was 255, it's being slow, 255, times the I thought I saw some more chat. Okay, so the 255 times the 298 divided by the 839. Okay, so what I observed was 111. That's what I observed. But what I would expect Theoretically, if these are independent events, is that I'd get 255 times 289 divided by 839. That is the theoretical value that I would expect to see out of this data. So I would take the 255, so the total for that row, 
times the, oops, being slow, times the column sum, which was 298, and divide that by the total survey, which is 839. And I do that for every cell. So I would expect 90.57. Okay, and then I just move to the next one over. The number of community college students that I would expect to volunteer for four to six hours. So then again, I take the row total for that community college student row. I multiply it by the column total, which is for four to six hours. And I divide that by 839. To get seven to nine hours for community college students, again, I take that row total, which was 255, times the column total for seven to nine hours, and I divide that by 839. So this is the row total times the column total divided by the total number. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next slide and I'm going to write down my expected values. Okay, if it'll come up. All right, so what we have here in the first table is what we observed. So when we surveyed our three, 839 people, we found 111 community college students uh, volunteered from one to three hours. Now what we expect when we take the 255 times 289 and divide it by 839, we would expect 91 of them to volunteer from one to three hours. I left everything to two decimal places. All right, so what we observed in our survey is that 96 community college students volunteered from four to six hours. What we would expect if it were theoretically perfect is that we would have 255 times 379 divided by 839. So we would expect 115 approximately to volunteer from four to six hours. Seven to nine hours, we observed that 48 college, community college students volunteered seven to nine hours. What we, we, we would expect theoretically is that to be 255 times 162 divided by 839 or 49.24, 49. In the second row, four-year college students, one to three hours, what we would expect is that 290 times 298 divided by 839 or approximately 103 four-year college students would volunteer from one to three hours. From four to six hours, what we would expect is 290 times 379 divided by 839, okay? For the seven to nine hours, what we would expect is 61, excuse me, 290 times 162 row total times column total divided by the total number surveyed. So we would expect 290 times 162 divided by 839, which is 56. In the third row, non-students, what would we expect to volunteer from one to three hours would be 294 times 298 divided by 839 or 104. What would we expect to volunteer from four to six hours? The row total 294 times the column total 379 divided by the total 839 or 132.81. What would we expect for seven to nine hours? The row total is 294. The column total is 162. 294 times 162 divided by 839. So the first table is what we observed. I don't want that one. 
And the second table is what we would expect. And I'm going to put those in my calculator in matrices. So I'm going to put what I observed in matrix A, and I'm going to put what I expect in matrix B. So boy, howdy, are you getting your money's worth from this calculator? Because now we're going to use matrices. And then it's just a simple conduct, um, conducting the test. Okay, so where do I find matrices on my calculator? On my calculator, the TI-84 plus or the TI-84 CE plus CE, the color, my matrix menu is above my inverse button. So over here on the left, the left side of my buttons, about in the middle is my X to the minus one. That's my inverse button. Above that button is my matrix menu. So if I hit second inverse, there is my matrix menu. Now I have matrices in here because I was playing with this earlier. So I'm going to go ahead and show you right now how to delete those. So as you're working your homework problems for section 11.3, pausing because my internet's unstable. So as you're working your problems and you're putting things in your matrices, you're going to want to delete them eventually because you're going to want to put another matrix in. So I'm going to go ahead and delete those and show you how to delete those. So above my plus key on my calculator is my memory key. So if I do second plus sign, that gets me to my memory menu. And I'm interested in number two, my memory management delete, because that's where I'm going to delete my matrices. So I'm going to go to number two. And on this menu, number five is matrix. So I'm going to click number five. And there are the two matrices that I have in my calculator. I want to delete those. So I'm going to hit the delete key, delete, and now those matrices are gone. So now I can go back into my matrix menu and input my observed values for these volunteers and my expected values for these volunteers. So I'm going to go back to second inverse, which gets me, oops, second inverse which gives me my matrix menu. Okay, and all I'm interested in in this statistics course is getting them in because then I'm gonna use the chi-squared test for uh, these two matrices. So I just need to get these matrices in. So I'm gonna go arrow over to edit. And the first matrix I'm going to edit is A. And that's where I'm going to put my observed values. So I'm going to hit enter. And the first thing my calculator asks is what are the number of rows and the number of columns in this matrix? So where my cursor is blinking on that one is the number of rows. Whenever you talk about a matrix and you describe it, you describe it by the number of rows it has, then the number of columns. So our matrix, since we had three types of volunteers and three different categories of their volunteering, so one to three, four to six, seven to nine, that's a three column matrix. So it's three rows, and three columns. So I type three and then enter. 
And you see immediately that my calculator creates three rows. And then I type three, enter, and my calculator creates my three columns. So now I have a three by three matrix. And I'm going to input these observed values by row. So my observed values were, there were 111 community college students who volunteered zero to three hours, one to three hours. So I had 111. So I'm gonna type in 111. And once I have it typed in, I hit the enter key. All right. So the next L, um, category I had was community colleges, students four to six hours, and there were 96 of those. So I'm gonna type that in. So these are all my observed values. And then I had 48 community college students volunteered from seven to nine hours. And when I inputted the 48 and hit enter, you notice that it dropped me down to the next row. So the next row was the four year college students. So I'm going to input my observed values for my four year college students, which was 96, 133, and 61, enter. So now I have my second row in, I'm gonna put my third row in, which was the non-student volunteers. So I had 91 volunteered from one to three hours. I had 150 volunteered from um, four to six hours and 53 from uh, seven to nine hours. So now I have my observed data inputted into my calculator in a matrix. So in a contingency table, if you will. And I'm just gonna make a quick check to make sure that I've inputted everything correctly and it looks good. Okay, so now I have my observed values in. Now I need to go put my expected values in. All right, put my expected values in. To put my expected values in, I'm gonna put those in matrix B. Now to do that, I need to actually exit out of this menu. So I'm gonna do a second quit. Now I'm gonna go back in and edit matrix B. You have to get out, otherwise it's gonna to try to put stuff in the first row, first column of your matrix. So I'm gonna go over to edit and I'm gonna put the expected values that I calculated in matrix B, number two. Okay, again, this is a three by three matrix, and I'm going to type in the expected values that I calculated by taking the row total times the column total and dividing it by the observed value total. So that first number we got was 90.57. And the next one I got was 115. 0.19 and 49.24. All right, the next row of what we expected was 103, 131, and 56. And then for the non students, what we expected was 104. 0.42, it's a lot of work to determine if these are dependent or not. Um, 132.81 and 56.77. Okay, I'm gonna do a quick check just to make sure that I've inputted this correctly because if I input one number incorrectly, then my answer is gonna be incorrect. So I always make sure that I get my matrices inputted correctly. All right, looks good. Now I'm gonna completely exit out of this menu because I'm done with the matrix menu. All right, now I'm gonna conduct my chi-squared test. 
So I'm going to go to stat, tests, and I'm going to find my chi-squared test. So in the previous examples, we used D, the chi-squared goodness of fit test. So that tested whether or not the data that we observed fit what we would expect it to have seen if it, fitted, if it fit a particular distribution. Now we're going to see if the two are independent. So we're going to conduct the chi-squared test. And it asks me, where did I put my observed values? And I put my observed values, my contingency table for my observed values in matrix A. I put the expected values that I calculated in matrix B. So I'm just going to go down and I'm going to hit calculate. And there you go. And it calculated the degrees of freedom for me, which would have been the number of rows, there were three rows, minus one, that's two, times the number of columns, there were three columns, minus one, that's two. So two times two is four. So my test statistic is 12.99, and my p-value is 0.0113, all right? So now I can use that information to go back and compare it to my level of significance to determine whether or not I reject or do not reject the null hypothesis. All right, so we're gonna go back to our PowerPoint. So I got from conducting the chi-squared test, which what I did was I went put the observed values in A, the expected values in B, matrix B. Then I went to stat, tests, C, the chi-squared test. My observed values, I had put in matrix A, my expected, I had put in matrix B. So my chi-squared test statistic was 12.99, and my p-value was 0 0.0113. Okay. Since I had used a level of significance of 0.05, that's the level of significance I chose. Again, that is something as a statistician, you determine, you choose what you want for alpha. How serious is a type one error to you? The less serious it is, the more the, uh, the higher alpha value you can use. The more serious it is to you, you need to reduce your alpha. You need to reduce the probability of a type 1 error. 0.05 is what we use most of the time. So since my p-value is less than my alpha, if my p is low, then the null must go. So I need to reject the null hypothesis. That means that these two factors the type of volunteer all right it's bad the type of volunteer that you have and the number of hours they volunteer is not independent of each other so the type of volunteer you get the number of hours they volunteer is dependent on that so at a 5% level of significance from the data there's sufficient evidence to conclude that the number of hours volunteered and the type of volunteer are dependent on one another. And that kind of sort of intuitively makes sense to me that they would be dependent on each other. All right, the last example, which I'm not going to have time to go through, but you can look at this 
in the PowerPoint slides. And then I, I challenge you to put this in your calculator and see what you get. Because I did create the expected value contingency table for you. So this is anxiety levels versus the need to succeed in school. So the first table there is what we observed. So for example, a high need to succeed and high anxiety, there were 35 out of the 400 people surveyed that not only have a high need to succeed in school, but they have high anxiety levels. So that's what I observed. What I would expect for that category would be the row total 155 times the column total 57 divided by the total 400. So what I would expect for that category, high need, high anxiety is 22. For medium high anxiety, and a high need to succeed in school, I observed 42 of the 400. What I would expect to see is the 155, the row total, times 95, the column total, divided by 400. So what I would expect to see if these are independent is 36.8, okay? So I've created the entire table for you. This is a three row, by five column matrix. There are five columns here. High anxiety, medium high anxiety, medium anxiety, and medium low anxiety and low anxiety. So it's a three uh, row, five column matrix. So in matrix A, you would put your first three row, five column matrix of the expected values. Excuse me, observed. It really doesn't matter. But I would put observed in A. And in B, I would put the second three by five matrix of the expected values, and then conduct the chi-squared test on those two matrices. And what you get when you conduct this test is you get chi-squared is 48.42, and P is so low, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Guess what? <laughs> your need to succeed in school and your anxiety levels are not independent of each other. <laughs> one is dependent on the other. <laughs> not a big surprise, I think. If the P is low, the null must go. That's pretty low. So uh, the need to succeed in school and anxiety levels are not independent of each other is the conclusion we would draw. All right, are there any questions? I've kept you a minute over, but we did finish chapter 11. Any questions? All right, I will um, render this recording and post it in Blackboard in announcements. I'll post a link to YouTube in announcements. Are there any questions? All right, we will talk to you Tuesday. Have a good rest of your week.